Flight Insight pilot training is designed not just for newer students, but for pilots at all levels. So even though most of us in general aviation don't often fly a procedure like a standard terminal arrival route, or STAR, it's really the bread and butter of most professional pilots' knowledge base. And it's still part of the required knowledge for the instrument rating. So let's look at an arrival procedure. This is the MADI-4 arrival into Bellingham, Washington. When I say most arrivals aren't flown by general aviation aircraft, it's because the altitude and speed minimums are usually out of range of most of our piston aircraft. But this particular arrival is flyable by some GA aircraft. Let's look at it illustrated. There are two branches or routes on this procedure. An arrival will typically be assigned by a center or approach controller prior to getting assigned and cleared for the approach. The branch of this arrival that you fly will depend on if the destination airport is using the north or south runway. ATC will tell us which runway is in use so we know which route to fly. The arrival begins at the Payne VOR. It has a minimum altitude of 16,000 feet. So some GA aircraft can do this if they're oxygen equipped and have some kind of turbocharging in the engine. Aircraft not able to meet these minimums can still be assigned the arrival, but ATC may say something like descend via the arrival except maintain 10,000 to Everett or something. Now from the Payne VOR at or above 16,000 feet, will fly course 333 degrees to Everett to cross that at or above 14,000. These other figures, 10,000 and 1,900, are the MEA and MOCA respectively, like you'd find on an en route chart. So you shouldn't fly those altitudes, but they're there for your awareness. It may be safe to fly at 10,000 or even lower on this segment, but stars are there for obstacle clearance as well as traffic flow control for ATC working the airports in this area. From Everett, we stay on the 333 degree course to Matty to cross that at or above 7,000. There's also a speed restriction of 250 knots here. The bar above it represents a maximum. Sometimes you'll hear ATC issue a descend via instruction and say something like delete speed restrictions, meaning the aircraft can fly whatever speed it likes as long as it adheres to other speed regulations in the FAR. This is important on arrivals. We need to lose a fair amount of altitude here, and descending quickly while maintaining a minimum airspeed can be tricky, so canceling speed restrictions can help aircraft descend more quickly. So from Maddie, the route splits off into two branches. Here's the textual description of the route when Bellingham is landing on runway 34. We'll be going to Belt, then Tubti, then on a track of 344 degrees to get vectors to the approach. If we were using the south runway 16, We'd follow that other route, which takes us out north of Bellingham towards that dashed line, which is the Canadian border. This gives us more time to descend, so notice the altitude minimums are a bit higher than on the route we're taking for runway 34, which goes more directly to the airport. When you're loading the procedure on the GPS, like the GTN 750 here, it'll query you for the runway in use, and your input determines the route it'll navigate you on. This is why ATC tells you in advance which runway is in use, so you have time to program the correct route. The instruction to descend via means we're allowed to fly the procedure's lateral course and descend at our discretion from our en route altitude to meet the altitude and speed restrictions at each point. If ATC tells us we're merely cleared for the MADI-4 arrival, we can fly the lateral course, but we can't leave our last assigned altitude until further instructed. Let's use that case as an example. We're coming from the en route phase at 17,000 feet, about 205 knots indicated. We've been told on this one that Bellingham is landing south, meaning we'll be taking that route from Maddy to Gerd. So we fly to Payne, but we have to stay at 17,000, as we weren't told to descend via the arrival. We pass Everett, staying at that altitude, and now are told to descend via. The next fix, Gerd, has a maximum altitude of 7,000, so we have a ton of altitude to lose in an 18-mile segment of space. This really becomes a problem on the north landing route, where there's less room to stretch our descent, and there are speed restrictions. Now we get a descend via instruction, but we're told to cross MADI at and maintain 7,000 following the north landing route. We begin a descent to meet the restrictions at Payne and Everett and be at 7,000 by MADI. We also want to reduce speed to 250 by MADI as well as before leaving 10,000 per the FARS, and this will eat up space too. Now we have 9 miles to go to belt, and we need to lose 3,000 feet and 40 knots. This is a ton of energy to bleed off in a short space, and we might not be able to make one or both of the requirements. ATC can notice this, or we can call it out for them, at which point they may say, descend via the arrival, which allows us to now leave 7,000 feet, 
and delete the speeds, which allows us to descend faster at a higher airspeed. As we descend, we maintain just under 250 knots, not worrying about the published speed restriction at belt. As we approach Bellingham, we'll get handed off to approach, whom will tell we're descending on the arrival, and then they'll assign us an approach, which will fly next. Arrivals are therefore an exercise in energy management. You don't want to be left high and fast on an arrival, especially if you step up to the bigger iron in the airlines. This is an easily overlooked aspect of instrument training since it's not something we do in most trainers, but it's required knowledge and is covered in depth in the Flight Insight IFR Ground School, which you can check out at the link here or in the description. See you there.